Okay, great. Sean, I'll wait 60 seconds before I introduce people, allow people just a minute to log on and get ready. Sounds great. Any big plans for Halloween, Sean? Ah, the four-year-old's pretty excited. We're ready for exactly. it. Brooklyn Halloween's pretty fun. Uh, and then I'm off to Uruguay the next day. We've got a lot going on in Uruguay next week, or in the, in the first week of November. Is your son a chocoholic? He actually doesn't bizarrely like candy or chocolate or anything, which is odd. But he uh, he definitely likes dressing up. So we're he's he's got his Mario costume ready to go. <laughs> I love it. I remember those days. My kids are all fully grown now, but that was a special time. Oh man, it's really special. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. I'm trying to get him. A, he's dressed as Mario, so I'm trying to get him a little like go kart that looks like Mario Kart that he can drive around the streets in his costume. <laughs> but that's that's the next level. Well, you're at the right place to come up with another vehicle, <laughs> right? Yeah, that's right. Well, listen. Well, Sean, let's let's get started. And firstly, um, I'd like to introduce myself, Mark Young, the co-CEO of Bridgepoint Capital, and I'm really blessed today with our keynote speaker, Sean Stewart, who's the CEO of New Lab. And that's why we're here today to hear from Sean and all the amazing things that are happening inside of the, the current four walls of New Lab at the Brooklyn Naval Yard. So we'll start now. And Jerry, if you'd be kind enough to advance to the next slide. So you can't have a presentation without a disclaimer. And yes, this is our disclaimer. In a nutshell, what it says is that we're empowered and encouraged to give financial information or education. We're discouraged from giving investment advice. So if anything that happens today you think is investment advice, we would encourage you to seek counsel and commentary from your investment professionals and go forward in that, that, that way. So that's our disclaimer. So Jerry, next slide, please. Those that have been on previous podcasts are going to say this looks awfully familiar, and it should, because it's really our approach at Bridgepoint to remind people of the importance of investment management and financial planning. And in a nutshell, we consider wealth management to be a four-legged stool, and you can or a three-legged stool, excuse me. So on the left, you see at the top of the seat, it says your net worth, which just to remind people. That's a combination of your investable assets, which we all know what those are, and your non-investable assets, which to remind people, that means things like your house, your car, your jewelry, your collectibles. The combination of those two items is your net worth. And things like trust and estate planning are, in our opinion, crucial to preserving your wealth because the fact is in America, anybody can sue anybody at any time for any reason. So you want to create what I'll call a financial moat around your net worth to protect your net worth. Plus, there's other things that trust state planning can achieve, whether you have charitable objectives or you want to make sure your grandkids and their education is paid for. You have all kinds of needs that you want to solve for, and that's what trust and state planning is all about. Second leg of the stool is tax planning. And I'm a former CPA, and what I can tell you, anybody can fill out a tax form. That's not where the skill is. The skill is really in the tax planning area so that you can anticipate future taxable events and take corrective action to minimize your tax burden. And the beauty of that exercise, you can document to the penny the value you created because if you didn't do the solution, your tax payment and your expense would be much higher. So tax planning is an important element here. And lastly, insurance. And no, we're not insurance brokers. However, the right insurance products give you what I call additional tax deferred vehicles, meaning like a 401k or an IRA, a Roth, et cetera. The, we call it private placement life insurance. So basically, if you have inefficient investments that generate taxable income, wrapping those investments in a private placement life insurance policy gets it for the taxes. So just by way of background, those are the three key efforts that we recommend people 
consider and pursue to enhance their at their tax returns. So one more slide on our private wealth and we'll get to the heart of the matter here. So just to remind people, if you look on the left, that pie chart, it basically says 90, over 90% of your return is attributable to getting your asset allocation right. And just again, to talk about this year and the traditional asset allocation, which people call 60-40, which means 60% stocks, 40% bonds, well, that may have worked in the past. It sure as hell didn't work this year because bonds are down 15% plus, equities are down 20% plus. So there was nowhere to hide. So no matter what you did, you lost money. However, our approach, which you see on the right-hand side, is I'll just say a heavy dose of alternatives. We call it the endowment model approach, which, by the way, this is the approach I did deploy at McKinsey and Company when I headed up the private wealth practice for the partners Coincidentally, it's the same approach used by the Yale Endowment and the advisory board of the Yale Endowment. Similarly, are the same people overseeing both programs. So it's not an accident that they both have a heavy dose of alternatives and have done extremely well this year. As an example, last year, the Yale Endowment and their fiscal year ends in June, their reported results for 2021 was up over 35%. This is a portfolio of over $20 billion that gained about a third. So net net equities, we believe is 40% of your allocation, which half of that can and should be in private deals, which is what we specialize in. There's also relative value, which is another way of saying market neutral hedge funds and inflation center securities, which in the current environment is what we're into. And we like things like the Goldman Sachs Commodity Index, which by the way is up 35% year to date. So yes, we're in an inflationary period, and yes, this is a great way to deal with inflation. So that's by way of background. By the way, we encourage people to reach out to us. We provide a one-hour education session for people that want to hear about this stuff and learn more about it. So if you so choose, reach out to us. We'd be happy to spend the hour with you. Okay, now we get to the star of the show and what we're here for. So firstly, as I mentioned, I'm Mark Young, the co-CEO of Bridgepoint Capital, and I'm very honored to have Sean Stewart, the CEO of New Lab, here to talk about really just an amazing success story called New Lab. And what I'll just say, Sean entered the New Lab story a few years back and with his magic wand has turned it into a juggernaut. There are a lot of companies out there that do I'll just say incubation, innovation. And honestly, I haven't seen anybody, literally anybody that does it the way these guys do it. And I don't want to steal Sean's thunder. So Sean, maybe you could start by giving us a little bit about your professional background. Yeah, it's very kind, Mark. And thanks for the intro. I always uh, learn a few things at the, at the outset. So it's great to see you again. And um, excited to talk a little bit about New Lab and what we're doing today. Um, my background, I, I've kind of split between 15 years in the travel business and then another 15 or so uh, or 10 uh, in, in advanced technology and frontier tech. Um, the first 15 years were early stage uh, kind of movement of businesses into the online world from the travel space. So Expedia in 2000, uh, Jet Setter after that at the Gilt Group here in New York, which we sold to TripAdvisor. I was the CEO there. Uh, then I joined Airbnb in 2013, um, back when it was couch surfing, but quickly becoming a lot bigger than that. Uh, and I led the development and, and execution of a strategy to win the leisure markets around the world when Airbnb was growing in these big uh, urban city centers. Um, then I joined Google X, which was the end of my time in travel and moving more into the frontier technology space. And I worked for Alphabet for a few years, uh, developing and commercializing the autonomous vehicle and autonomous truck solutions. Uh, and so we built a company called Waymo, which is Google's self-driving car company. I was a chief business officer there. And then I got a call about this crazy place in the Brooklyn Navy out about four and a half years ago and flew out here to take a look and spent the weekend uh, in New York with my wife. And if we jump to the next slide, we essentially, um, uh, we can go to the next one. We were brought to the Brooklyn Navy Yard, which is a 300 acre campus, if you don't know the Brooklyn Navy Yard, uh, nestled between Dumbo and Williamsburg in New York City. Just a four minute ferry ride to Wall Street and 34th Street. So really in the heart of, um, of New York overall on the East River. But the building that I'm calling you from is in front of you, which is building 128, 
was opened in uh, 94 and used by the Navy for about 50, 55 years for developing the engines for the battleships of the First and Second World War. We have a dry dock at the rear of the building where they used to literally take the engines that they build, like a kind of a production line, like a Model T Ford, and they would take the engines out the rear of the building and onto the battleships and ships that you see in this photo, and then out to water from there. Um, but we got the opportunity when Mayor Bloomberg brought us to see the building, David Belt and Scott Cohen are the two co-founders of New Lab. And about eight years ago, they were brought to the building and given an open-ended question of what would you do if you were given access to this building over a long-term lease um, at very favorable terms? And what would you do with it that would be good for New York? And so the founders responded with this vision of creating a center of gravity, a home for frontier technologists to build their companies, have access to the labs and equipment they need, have access to the community of technologists that can support their work, but also crucially access to the 300 acre campus to test and develop technology across. And just for context of why proving grounds are so valuable to these types of entrepreneurs, is an example at Google when we were doing self-driving cars and self-driving trucks, you needed a private area to operate and test the technology on. You can't test a self-driving truck on 101 in San Francisco before it's roadworthy. You have to do it on private grounds. And so the best opportunity we had from a real estate perspective was to acquire Moffat Airport, the active commercial airport in Mountain View, and then use the runway for deploying trucks on the runway when you weren't uh, landing those um, landing planes on the runway massive cost to, to actually test and develop the technology here in the navy yard you can do that for a fraction without obviously having to acquire land and so we started attracting startups and technologists from around the world here to our building new lab that you can see here um, that we developed over about a two-year real estate conversion project um, and raising 50 million in non dilutive capital from government sources to to build the center and so today there's 236 uh, just over 900 people who build and develop their technology here every year. They test it across the Navy Yard. And so for the first two years of running it, David and Scott were really focused on the building co-working, building a home for these technologists. I joined four years ago. And since then, we've developed a business which is a center of invention with a range of different capabilities and tools that clients, investors, governments, and corporations can use uh, to make wise uh, investments as well as wise R&D decisions of how to develop the next level of technology for their business, for their government operation. And so we can jump to the next slide. And so our focus, if you look at the business today, is really in three major areas. This is where our expertise lives. We're a center of invention that focuses on mobility. If you join to the next slide. Um, and from there, we move a lot of our focus into energy. Uh, and our third area of focus is in the transition to new materials. And so you can think about that mobility is the movement of people and goods. That's everything from supply chain to autonomous vehicles, to drones, to new fuel sources for airplanes. You have a lot that co is covered in mobility. And our mobility work is centered in Detroit. That's our physical center of gravity where we have a new lab there that's opening in December in partnership with Ford Motor Company. It's called Michigan Central, the campus there that's operated. Um, and, and we use that as our focus area for all of our mobility work. Then here in Brooklyn, we do most of our energy and materials work. Um, that includes piloting of everything from bi-directional charges to new fuel sources um, and the development of new materials. Companies like Modern Meadow growing leather from collagen, companies like Memphis Meats growing duck breasts in lab environments, all of the kind of looking at the future of how we won't kind of raise uh, materials in the same way we have today. We're actually grow them in the lab environment from a cellular agriculture perspective. So a lot of interesting work in materials. And so if you jump to the next slide, the key question then is like, how do we do all? And so you essentially have three major kind of assets that we utilize um, to help investors, help corporations and help governments access early stage technology. Um, that they can de-risk and understand before making these kind of important decisions of what new technology to add to the business. Our first and most important asset and where we started is people. We have our team and our community and our global network. We have a, a 236 startups, 900 different entrepreneurs who are part of our community today, but we also have a brand that's able to access and reach into academia and to startups around the world when we push, push out open calls and opportunities to work with us. 
We then have our infrastructure, which are these labs, as well as proving grounds to test and develop technology on. It's one thing to say you have uh, a, a, a GPS alternative location system. It's another thing to be able to test it across 300 acres and prove to an investor or a client that this actually does what it is designed to do. The concept of making investment decisions off of a, off of a startup pitch deck in, an, in advanced technology just doesn't work as much in other as other segments. If a company is claiming they've developed quantum safe communication channels, you need to pilot that solution to understand if it actually delivers on its promise. Um, because without that, obviously, the investment is uh, has has a significant um, kind of concern around it. And so, infrastructure is the second thing we invest in: proving grounds and labs, so that we can test technology in the real world to understand its capability. And the final piece is our platforms, which is really our what we have as capabilities on the team. And we essentially have three major vehicles here. We have applied innovation, which is where we take problem sets or opportunities or inefficiencies from corporate and government, and we build challenges around them. We source technology from around the world in its early stage development, and we pilot it against those challenges to prove what is the most viable uh, solution out there today. And we can talk about a few examples next, Mark, once we lay the groundwork. Um, then you also have venture building as a key platform and capability that we can deploy, which is sometimes a corporate will give us a challenge that we actually won't find a viable solution in the market today. Nothing in academia, no IP or patents that are relevant, no fundraising from startups, no products in the market. And in those cases, we often go back to both the clients and ourselves internally and say, maybe we should consider building a new venture in this space. You know the industry and are claiming the solution is very valuable to your industry. We know the technology in the market and have found that there's not a viable solution being developed today. Maybe we should invest ourselves in building that solution. And then the final piece, obviously very relevant today, is the, is the ability to invest, where we team up with folks like Mark at Bridgepoint, where we actually take these insights we develop from these pilots. The average VC makes an investment decision in, in our space after 10 hours with a startup. We spend 10 hours a day. We pilot these companies over 12 months with corporate and government clients. Our diligence is far deeper, and we use that diligence to make appropriate and wise investment decisions in this exciting category. And so all of this happens around mobility, energy, and materials. And then we have the lab where we spend 20% of our time working on new areas of focus that could be added to the three focus areas today. And that's just where we we explore new categories that we don't have the expertise in, but are starting to learn about and consider whether we should focus on in the future. Um, so yeah, so on to the next slide. And I think then we can just discuss those as the main pieces of materials. So um, happy to talk, talk a little sure. bit more about that, Mark, and give you some real world examples well, for the audience as well. Let me just start. I want to get to some real life examples of all the amazing things you've done. But before I do that, I just wanted to say, I, you, you do many things, but at a high level, you have, I'll just say, corporates who desperately need to innovate. So on the one hand, you have the need, and on the other hand, you have the hotshot entrepreneurs that want to go do their startups, get backed by the Sequoias of the world or whoever, and do their own thing. But yet, they need each other. And mm -hmm. without you in the middle, they would never get to each other. So- yep. Maybe just describe, I call it being the marriage broker or whatever you want to call it, but big corporates desperate for innovation, early stage startups wanting to work with corporates but keep their own independence and viability and sustainability and most importantly, identity. How, mm -hmm. how you make these two parties that naturally wouldn't want to work together coexist and create the win-win? Because -win? I think that's just one of many things you crack the case on. I think you're unique in that way. Yeah, I think you nailed that. I think that's certainly where a lot of the secret sauce is and a lot of the challenge. A large corporate entity with 100,000 employees teaming up with a startup of 15 employees. Uh, one is speaking Japanese and the other is speaking German. These are just different company cultures, different environments, different experience levels. And you do need the facilitation and translation in between the two. Um, I think there, there's obviously been a consistent strategy globally with corporations where to innovate, they hire great staff and they run R&D processes internally. They own the IP, they own the product, they own the talent, which are full-time employees. 
And that's a very costly method of developing and innovating around problem sets that exist for a corporation. I came from one of those type of strategies. Google X is essentially Alphabet's uh, moonshot factory where they hire the best people in the world to work on developing the best technology for significant solutions. And Google owns that IP. They own everything developed in that type of an environment. Now, even for the best of the best, like Alphabet, that is a very difficult and expensive strategy. You're hiring everybody full time, you're housing them, real estate, cost of everything. And the benefit to that is you own the IP in theory, but you are only as good as the staff you have and the program you run in house. Now, what we say to people is we're not going to mess with that. You do whatever you want internally, have your own R&D systems, your own innovation approaches in house. What we give you access to are the entrepreneurs that are venture capital funded who don't want to work for you. And technology being developed outside of your building is still relevant. It's still going to impact you in the global market, even if it's not being developed within your corporation. So how do you know what's happening outside of your four walls? How do you test it, understand its viability, learn from the leadership teams, understand the talent being involved in it? And then how do you make the right decisions with kind of an informed insight into those new technologies before any of your competitors do? And so that's essentially what our programs do is take a year at minimum to tackle a very specific challenge for a government or a corporate, go out and look at all the potential solutions being developed around the world that could be appropriate, pick the best seven to 10, pilot the ones that have the most viability across 100 day pilots each, write case studies about how the pilots performed and whether the technology lived up to its promise. And then the client can make pretty well-informed investment licensing or acquisition decisions based on that insight. They don't own the IP, which is why this model is a fraction of the cost to the corporate governments. You're not, you know, something like a Google X has budgets annually in the billions of dollars. You can run innovation studios for one to two million dollars over a 12 month period, learning about every viable solution, piloting the best seven to 10, then making an informed investment decision or acquisition or licensing decision. For the startup, this is they line up around the block for these opportunities. And so let's jump into a real world example that'll give a sense of how valuable this can be for a startup or a technologist. One of our 25 studios today is with the DOT here in New York City Department of Transportation. And the challenge they gave to us is New York City has committed to 10,000 sidewalk charges, charges that can be plugged into electric vehicles when they park on the streets of New York City in Queens and in and in Manhattan. So they've committed to this 10,000 charger system, but have not found the solution yet, the vendor that they will actually partner with to install and develop those charges. New York City's government is not gonna do it themselves. They need obviously a vendor to team up with. So they brought that challenge to us. We first spent a hundred days looking at the infrastructure of New York, the power grid, what the solution needed to look like, what, what the KPIs of success would be from a New York City government perspective, the cost metrics they're looking for as well as the capabilities that a solution needs to deliver on. Um, then we went out in the world and looked at all of the technology being developed in academia, patents that have been filed, fundraising rounds completed, looking at all the different companies out there working on this potential technology. In the same way that the telephone was patented by three different people within a 90-day period, there are so many different companies who have seen the same opportunity. How do you convert existing grid and sidewalk power into charging infrastructure for vehicles. So the question is not, can you find a solution? Let's find the best solution. So you go out and look at all the companies working on it. You interview them, you research it, and you usually whittle it down to a best list of 20. Then you interview those with the client and get deeper into their IP and technology. And then for a million and a half to $2 million studio, you usually pick seven to 10 of those potential solutions to actually pilot. And so with the case of New York, out of that entire cycle of work, they came, we came to the conclusion of the three best viable solutions for, charge work, for sidewalk charging. One was here right at Columbia University coming out of academia, which was a company called Vault Post, which was being developed at Columbia, which we can talk about today how their, how their technology works. And the two others we actually found in the UK, Connected Curb and Chargey. We then brought them into the studio and they have now designed and deployed their own charging solutions in New York, one in Brooklyn, one in Manhattan, one in Queens. And these chargers will be now available in the near future for 
vehicles and customers to use on a daily basis over a hundred day pilot period where the city will get to watch how these charging solutions use, what's the customer experience, what impact do they have on the grid, what revenue do they generate, what are the shortcomings and what are the wins of each solution. And at the end of that 12 month cycle, New York City government could make a decision on who is the most viable partner to support in this expansion of 10,000 sidewalk charges. While for the startup, they are getting a free opportunity to prove their technology is the winner when it comes to this pretty important space. And again, this is just piloting in one market versus obviously the global expansion potential of, of that type of product. So I can pause for a minute, Mark. I'm sorry, that was me rabbiting on for a bunch. So definitely see uh, which you know, direction to go with that. First of all, I love everything you said, but just to take a step back, the city of New York basically hires you guys to, I'll just say, <clears throat> source viable tech solutions to this need that they have. And frankly, this need is a global need, as we all know. So automobiles are going electric, and the last mile of charging cars is not solved yet. <clears throat> so we right. had Biden's most recent law that he passed on infrastructure is going to allocate money to the space. So the world is just moving in the direction of, I'll just say, last mile charging, if I can call it that. And New York City being at least in the U.S., the most important city in the U.S. and maybe most important city in the world, having an outcome where New York City says, I want those 10,000 less mild charging poles from XYZ company, that is absolute magic. That's gold, okay, from a mm -hmm. viability standpoint, endorsement standpoint, but most importantly from a fundraising standpoint. My nickname was Money Mark, so... I know this much, if I have an opportunity to put money into a company that New York City is gonna give a 10,000 mandate last mile award to, that's extremely valuable. So if you don't mind, let's connect the dot from opportunity to investment because our belief is you wanna do good and do well. And mm -hmm. you know everything you're saying, and we haven't even gone to all the other case studies, which we could spend hours on, but the do good, good, the do good aspect of your business gets five stars. It's brilliant. Okay, we haven't really talked about how you convert to do good and to do well financially. But totally. let's just play yeah. that out for me. How do we turn this opportunity into investment profit? That's right. So that's perfect. And so the financial model is essentially. These innovation studios make the business profitable in the short term. The combination of the innovation studio revenue from clients to run these processes, plus the 230 startups that pay to be based out of our buildings here in New York and, and in Detroit, those are our two sources of month to month revenue and profitability. While on the other side, we syndicate investment opportunities to an audience of 1,400 different investors. And we work with you, Mark, at Bridgepoint to surface investors to your community of, 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 of private wealth individuals where we can bring to them investment opportunities packaged with this incredible depth of diligence that you just mentioned. Here is a sidewalk charging company that we think you should potentially invest in. Here's their product, their technology, their team. Here's the pilot they ran with New York City for 100 days. Here's the outcome of the pilot. Here's New York City's level of interest in expanding the partnership and deploying their solution. Is that an interesting investment opportunity to consider? And that depth of diligence to us is superior to what you'll see in other areas of the market when it comes to investing in advanced technology and especially hardware and solutions that have to be deployed in the real world. They just require a deeper understanding of their capabilities than a software play or a marketplace business as an example. Um, New Lab earns carry on all of those investments. So we get, if you invest in one of our syndicated deals, we get 20% carry, but to charge no management fees or deal fees. And so on that side of the business, New Lab is, a, is generating a library of, of, of kind of percentage of wins that our investors uh, get access to. And so that builds long-term a, a very viable and valuable business that's generating a secondary source of, of value and, and assets, if that makes sense. Let, let me build on what you just said, and I'm going to put a disclaimer out there that I'm giving our audience information. I'll say it's not audited and don't rely on it. But with those two disclaimers, the uh, 
syndication business you're just describing where you were in Cary, I saw an analysis of deals that you had done. And this was, I'll say, for the first 24 months or two years. And the paper profit of where you came in valuation-wise to where the next round of money came in valuation-wise and what the step up on valuation was, was a 4x return over two years. Now that, again, it's not bad. That, that's, that's, that's historical. Okay. <laughs> and maybe if you don't mind, give us some insights. Of, that's not by accident that you have that kind of rapid appreciation and in investment, which again is just one for the history books, but how do you think you're able to do that? Yeah, I think it, anytime you're looking at these investments, there's a couple different pieces, which is how early do you get in, which obviously impacts potentially what the return on investment looks like. When you get in that early, how much do you trust and understand the team that's leading it? How viable are they to, to grow with the product and its demand? Are they really the right leaders to take this to the next level? Does the product and technology actually work? Is it market leading? Will it be well adopted? Do the economics make sense? Can it actually deliver on its promise? You have all these questions as an investor. Now, in the more historical and traditional approach, you meet with these entrepreneurs as many times as you can to try to give yourself confidence in all of these boxes. I think he's going to be a good leader because I've met with him three times for lunch and he's, he or she seems like a viable CEO. Um, you can do backgrounds, you can talk to pe people who've worked with this leader before, you can do your diligence that way. As a comparison, we live with these teams 365 days a year. So when we assess who's a great leader, which teams are working well together, who has the ability to lead the company to the next generation, it's not few, through a few meetings, it's through daily interaction with them and their teams over the course of years. This business has been around for six years. Some of our companies have grown from teams of five to teams of 500 over that period. So we not only get early access to the deal flow, which is one incredibly important aspect to that return on investment is how early do you get into these opportunities and how much does the rest of the global market know about this interesting investment opportunity and how much do you have to compete against them? And so what does the valuation look like that you're getting into? And then the combination on the other side is how strong are your decisions? Like how you're getting in early, but are you picking the right horses early? And for us, that feels like that combination of time with the leadership, piloting of the solutions with clients that can give us direct feedback on the viability of the product. Um, and the ability to support them once the investment is made and even if it's not which is we are then here with these companies every day able to support them as they make progress with introductions to the right players if they succeed in in deploying urban charging here in new york we got to take it to chicago next and boston and and austin and oakland and so how do you start supporting their growth once they're part of the community as well um so yeah, we think that return is because you get in early, you have the d best amount of depth of diligence to make the right informed decisions, and then you can support them to grow efficiently and successfully once the investment is made as well. So let's call what you just described the theory, which I just support 100%, and let's take it to practice. So you have what you think are huge upside businesses, you're getting in early, you see these catalysts that will drive valuation. And the reality is it's been validated by next round of investment. So you have, I don't want to use words like insider information. This is not a public company where you're trading on insider info. It's not like that at all, but knowledge is power. And you're living and breathing these companies side by side. And, you know, you, you can spot the winners and you do. And I think, it's incredible. So that's just a little bit about how you do good and do well. I want to bring it, if I may, back to a couple more real life examples, if you don't mind. So yeah. we talked about energy and there was, there is a member company that's, and you'll do a much better job than I will, but it's called Amogy and it's converting ammonia into hydrogen. Maybe use that as a case study. Tell us that story and, who got behind it financially and how it's doing because it's a you know early stage but an exciting success story yeah you bet 
Um, so that's uh, the story of Song Hyun and his uh, and his co-founder. He's from Seoul in Korea. He did his um, master's at MIT. Uh, and we read a paper that they've done where they created a drone at MIT that could fly on liquid ammonia. So a common agricultural fertilizer, um, readily available, low cost. But within ammonia, the kind of chemical makeup of ammonia has hydrogen and nitrogen within it. And they built essentially their modern version of an engine or a system that could take the hydrogen out of the ammonia and use it as a fuel source. Um, not only was it readily available and low cost, but it also has no output, no exhaust, no CO2 impact. So a completely clean energy source that could potentially be deployed in all matter of different use cases. Their first pilot was a drone. So they had proved the case with a drone and had certain efficiency of, of energy compared to a diesel fuel as an example, but it was in the low end, I think it was 15, 20% of the output of what diesel has at that low, that low model form. Um, so we read about them, reached out to them, said, you gotta come build this in Brooklyn. We have 300 acres for you to fly your drone on, to develop vehicles that run on ammonia, boats that run on ammonia. We can build you the labs that you need come do it in Brooklyn, don't do it anywhere else in the world. Don't go back to Korea, don't go back to Boston. Let's, let's do this right here in New York. So they joined as a team of two. They then built a golf cart that was fueled with ammonia and could run on ammonia here in the Navy Yard. They then raised their first fundraising. I can't call it a seed because it ended up uh, being a $45 million round. And so it was a very large first round. And Amazon was the lead investor in that, really focused on could the technology solve the sustainability issues of the shipping industry that they rely on so much for their supply chain. For Amazon to reach their sustainability goals, something needs to happen regarding the legacy ships that moves uh, supply around the world. Um, so they raised that round. We built them an ammonia lab and a hydrogen lab here in the building. Um, we allowed them to uh, have access to a dock as well. And we brought in a John Deere tractor as the next product that they worked on, which is they converted a John Deere diesel tractor, like a legit, you know, the tires are bigger than me, agriculture tractor. And they were able to prove they completely replaced its diesel engine with ammonia-based engine, moved the efficiency of the energy output north of 50% of what diesel gets. So they continue to make this better and better. Um, and they were able to do all of this right here in New York City. They've now hired 90 people in a year. They've built their own uh, office here in the Navy Yard for non-technical talent. So we have the engineers, the HR, finance, BD is in a different building. Um, and they're now raising their Series A, which is looking at a $150 million round. And this has all happened in 19 months here from us reading a research paper at MIT to them joining and that kind of rocket ship growth. And so that's an example where we believed in the team, we saw and tested the viability of the technology, and we're able to syndicate the earliest investment opportunity into that company. Um, we could expect, we haven't seen where the Series A valuation will come, but you'd probably expect a 3x of what the original seed investment was 18 months earlier. Um, it's paper value, it's not completely gained, obviously, but you can see how that's a great example of getting into a company where we saw incredibly exciting technology validated by corporate interest and corporate pilots. We were able to test the technology real world here in the Navy Yard and see how it performed. And we were able to watch Song Hyun as the CEO and how he led his organization through this incredibly challenging early stage period. And we're very impressed with him. And so that's one of 236 companies here, but an incredibly exciting one in the energy space. Again, we each one of your verticals, there are success stories like the Amogee success story. And I'm going to go back to something in the healthcare space because that's near and dear to me personally. But net net, during the outbreak of the COVID crisis, there was an extreme shortage of ventilators. And New York City basically knocked on your door and said, we need help. And that's my way of letting you describe not only the challenge you faced, but the success you achieved and the validation that Halo Effect gave to New Lab, but it's an amazing story. Do you want to share that with the, with the team? Yeah, no, I appreciate it. Um, yeah, this was the first year of the pandemic, March of the first year. So this is when there was, there was an 18 wheeler on my block storing bodies for the local hospital. Like this was a pretty rough period of the first pandemic, March to June. 
Um, and the EDC contacted us as long, along with the mayor's office here in New York and essentially outlined that they needed three to 4,000 um, ventilators within uh, a 12 week period was the original request. Um, they had looked at sourcing them from outside of the US, mainly from China. There was a six to 12 month delay delivery, which as you can remember, probably got worse than that over time on the supply chain side. And the units they were looking at were forty to fifty thousand dollars, and quickly increasing in price point because the demand for ventilators at that stage in COVID was was skyrocketing. Um, so New York City needed four thousand units, but needed only had a budget of four thousand dollars per unit, so a tenth of the cost of what the public market product looked like. And so they reached out to us and said, "Would you be able to help either source or develop a solution quite rapidly? Can you do the twelve month program you usually do, but do it in twelve weeks instead?" And this one is an example where venture building was more viable for us than sourcing and piloting existing solutions because we couldn't find any $4,000 ventilator on the market. We couldn't find anything even at the bridge ventilator level that could achieve the goals the hospitals had at that price point. But we did find a design from a professor Slocum at MIT who had designed a AMBU bag pumper, a system that could pump an AMBU bag. It's what people pump when they're trying to give oxygen to someone who can't breathe. Um, and he had designed a system that could pump an AMBU bag at the right intervals and have the right settings to keep someone alive and breathing uh, when there wasn't a ventilator, a fully, a fully functioned uh, a ventilator available for them. We reached out to the professor. He'd retired. He never built this uh, device that he had designed. His build of materials, he thought, was around $3,000, so it was in the price range we were looking at. And so we convinced him to essentially hand over the patent and the design uh, of the product in exchange for ownership in a new company that we built called Spiro Devices. We then spent six to seven weeks rapidly prototyping his design. We teamed up with 10X Beta, which is one of the new lab companies here in our building in Brooklyn, and essentially ran 24, engi 24 hour engineering shifts for six weeks to develop the prototype. Uh, we then did pig trials, where essentially you remove the, you know, the breathing capability of a live animal and prove that your device can keep them alive. Uh, then we did quick trials at New York City hospitals. Then the FDA came out and give us, gave us emergency use authorization for the design and the product that we developed. And then we teamed up with Boyce Industries in Long Island City that built and delivered the 4,000 units to the New York City hospitals. The project ended up taking about 16 weeks instead of 12. Um, we ended up hitting the cost target and the volume they were looking for and all the functionality they needed. Um, and this ended up winning us Fast Company's Innovation Company of the Year. Um, we also were covered in about 400 million media impressions, everything from an article in the New Yorker to a full page in the journal and the Times. But it was a fantastic project that showed our capabilities in not only applied innovation, but also venture building. And I'll just say, proves that you guys are heroes, too. This mandate that you received, I'm sure when you got it, you're like, oh, God, what the hell are we going to do with this thing? But you took on the project and you, you kicked ass. So, you know, that's really cool. Well done. Um, I appreciate it. Yeah, it definitely goes to Scott, one of our co-founders. I thought we were nuts to try to do this, but <laughs> he had the confidence and, and, yeah, the team pulled it off. Give us an example. Your, your fast company, you know, Business of the year sounds great, but as an example, who were some of the winners prior to you winning the award? Just so that people can put it in context. Uh, uh, the year before we New Lab won it, Google won it. Um, so I was at Google when we won this award. Uh, prior to that, Nike won it um, for their innovation work. So it is usually gone to very large global corporations that have obviously that in house approach that we talked about to innovation. And so it was, yeah. Quite, quite the signal to suggest someone like us with an approach that doesn't develop and own the IP, but has a more open platform for innovation approach is, is receiving those type of awards. So it was a significant validation of our, our system, which we really appreciated. And again, I don't want to mean to sound like a commercial because it's going to come across that way. And nobody's perfect, but in my eyes you are. So sorry about that. <laughs> uh, let's, let's just, Pull out a couple more examples, if I may, but there could be dozens and dozens of them. So let's move away from transportation and healthcare for just for a moment. But there's a business, you have to disclose the name, 
that was using a new form of fermentation. And I drink kombucha. So tell the audience what happened with that story, because that's also really exciting. And it's part of the future of food development. Yeah, that was um, a company called Kingdom Supercultures that uh, we learned about through their Y Combinator program in San Francisco, where they were one of the companies at a demo day there. Um, and so they essentially work in manipulating the microbials in food and fermentation processes to either create new food products or to remove some of the negative com components of a, of a natural food product. And so you mentioned kombucha, which is a good example. It's a fermented tea drink. It has one to 2% of alcohol, which limits distribution to some parts of the world. It also needs to be cold stored and transported, which makes it significantly more expensive. And so Kendall and the team at Kingdom Supercultures were essentially, as, as their proof of concept, were able to alter and manipulate the natural fermentation in that tea so that they could create a version that didn't need to be cold stored to maintain its natural and, and kind of nutritional value. Um, and also one that didn't have alcohol and the high levels of sugar, 30 to 40 grams of sugar per bottle, as well as that one to 2% of alcohol. And so with that, you're essentially able to take, you know, a $12 product that, that my wife probably drinks a couple times a week um, and sell it for a significantly cheaper because it doesn't need to be transported in refrigerated trucks. But also you've unlocked new viable markets where you can sell the product without uh, the issue of its alcohol content. And so they joined here uh, right in the office behind us. They needed wet labs and clean rooms in New York. So we built them for them. We syndicated the investment opportunity with the same terms of Sequoia and the Y Combinator program that they had come out of. So I think it was a $28 million valuation cap. Um, but don't quote me. It was something in the low, the low to high 20s or mid to high 20s. Um, we then supported them as they grew the team here, grew from five or six that joined to a couple dozen. Then they ended up raising a much larger round, built their own headquarters here in New York City, 11 Madison Park, the kind of the hardest restaurant to get into in New York City, announced it was uh, transforming to a fully vegan tasting menu. And the cheese course that you would eat at that vegan tasting menu was made by Kingdom Supercultures and was essentially three cheese varietals that have never existed on the planet where they re-engineered existing cheeses to make new, new products. Um, the valuation, I think, in the Series A moved from the 28 to just north of 110, but I'd have to go back and look at the data. And so you had in a year people making north of 5x on their investment, again, because we were able to get in early, able to understand and witness the team in the real world and see how they performed and gain confidence in that team, and then able to see how uh, both government and corporate partners reacted to their technology and the viability of it which gave us confidence to make an investment decision. So a really exciting one. Unfortunately, they're too big and not in the building anymore. They're still members and show up here once in a while, but they have their own headquarters here now in, in Brooklyn. And it's great to watch these companies scale from the five or six to the two or 300 in, in New York City. Maybe just, again, just to throw out a key, key performance indicator, but what percent of tech jobs in Brooklyn today do you think can trace back their lineage to New Lab? If you had to take a guess what percent that is today. Oh, I appreciate it. Yeah, I mean, that's one of the things that makes this business interesting from a public pr private perspective is the first 40 something million in capital we raised was non dilutive from government sources. And that was because the Empire State Development Fund, the EDC, Eric Adams, the Partnership Fund for New York, Mayor Bloomberg at the time all had a belief that this type of system would create tech jobs in New York City. And in the first four years of, of New Lab's operations, the Center for Urban Futures here in New York wrote a report saying 11% of Brooklyn's tech jobs were coming out of this building. And that isn't because we grow companies of 5,000 people in our building. It's because we take teams of five that grow into teams of 200, then leave the building and grow further here in New York City. And so you can kind of draw a line back to the lineage of where they started to give credit to New Lab for that growth. Um, and that is what it has really spurred interest from other cities in bringing the kind of New Lab approach to open innovation to these new markets. Let, let me just reemphasize what you said. But if I'm a government and I put 50 million collectively into New Lab and non-dilutive capital, that's another way of saying grants or donations, but which is nice. If I'm receiving that, capital versus equity, I'll do that trade all day long because one of them 
is more or less free money. The other one, I'm giving a percent of my business away. So I get that That's part right. of it. But having the ability to create 11% new tech jobs, they're the dream jobs of the tax base because they're, you know, they're smart, they're high earners, they pay a lot of taxes, they're great for the local economy, they have a multiplier effect because they go out to dinners, all the stuff that they really have a very positive influence on the tax, tax base. And it doesn't shock me the least that other governments domestically and internationally want to see how you do this because they want one too, right? Mm -hmm. Now, we've, yeah. before we kicked off this discussion today, I was asking about your son who's four years old and uh, getting ready for Halloween. And then you said the next day you're off to Uruguay. Maybe we haven't even talked about that. But again, we could spend hours going over all the cool stuff you're doing. But maybe just give people a window of what you're doing with Uruguay right now. Yeah, you bet. No, I appreciate the call out. Um, yeah, the president of Uruguay visited New Lab a couple of years ago. And when people visit New York and want to talk about technology and innovation, they usually get told to go visit this crazy shipbuilding facility in the Navy Yard. And so we just get an incredible amount of really interesting and impressive visitors through the building, which is a fantastic part of the ecosystem. Uh, and this time the president of Uruguay visited and his aspirations for the country of Uruguay was how do we attract all the talent from South America, Latin America, bring them to Uruguay to build and scale their companies. We've all seen some of the economic challenges occurring in Brazil and Argentina and other parts in Peru. How do you build a, a safe space, a center of gravity to attract technologists to build in, in the country of Uruguay um, and, and actually grow jobs through that vehicle? And so our feedback was that we've seen these studios really galvanize and attract people in the same way that we're bringing two startups from the UK to pilot sidewalk charging infrastructure systems in New York. If the New York government picks one of those two UK companies as their partner, that UK company is now growing in New York instead of in Europe. We've literally moved an entire venture to be expanding into the US market. It's job growth, it's capital. Everything will now be a US entity, a US-based impact versus a UK impact. Um, that is what we pitched to Uruguay. Brand your country as test Uruguay. Allow technologists from around the world and around Latin America to come to Uruguay test their technology in the airports, in the cattle industry, in the paper mills, in the railroad industry, in the docks. And New Lab can help you by running these innovation studios that attract the talent. And so we developed a partnership with them where they essentially subsidize through government funding the cost of running innovation studios for corporate and government bodies if they run the studio in Uruguay. So in Colombia, we're working with Leonisa, the textiles company, looking at smart textiles and the future of materials in general. They are now running their pilots for that studio in Uruguay because they receive support from the government there in exchange for running their program in the region. So all of the materials uh, entrepreneurs that are now in that studio, instead of doing the pilots in Colombia or in New York, are doing it in Uruguay. And if that partnership expands and they start to develop partnerships and corporate relationships in Uruguay, then the companies can grow from there. And so you can just imagine an average studio has seven to 10 pilots. If you run five pilots a year in Uruguay, you're bringing 50 companies from around the world to pilot their solutions in Uruguay and then preferably scale and grow their post pilot, depending on the outcomes of it. So it's just become an engine for attracting people to that region to test and deploy their technology in, if we're being candid, an area that they probably didn't have on their roadmap. I don't know if a company in Korea was thinking about piloting in Uruguay or one in Chile, but this brings hopefully an incremental volume of talent to the region. All right, well, thank you for the Uruguay update. We have a few yeah, minutes yeah. left. Um, we do wanna have a, a hard stop at two o'clock. We have currently one question I think you touched on it, but some of it you haven't touched on. So let me just repeat the question that Lee Cosmac is asking you. Oh, so nice. the question is, how much does New Lab currently have invested in their investment syndication portfolio and who runs that portfolio? Yeah. 
Yeah, so to date, New Lab has never invested uh, off balance sheet. So we haven't raised money to invest directly into companies. We've done it through syndication, which is essentially giving access to private investors to our deal flow or working with you and your investment community, Mark, to, to find people who are interested in these deals. Um, so we don't actually put our own money in to date, but there's definitely a possibility in the future that we would raise a fund. To use money raised for the company to operate as investment capital potentially isn't the best way to do that. It'd be more intelligent to potentially build a fund on site, which is certainly something we've kept in mind as we've expanded the business. The distributions, like Lee spot on, I think that's the next exciting thing to come. We had our first opportunity at a liquidity of one of our SPVs, which is what happens is as the companies grow through C to series A and B, the they typically or hopefully see oversubscribed rounds so we might invest at a seed level which is what we did with strong arm technologies the haptic sensors for factory workers we invested at a below 25 million dollar valuation at the seed level when the company was being founded here at new lab by the time they got to their series a their valuation was 128 million and then we had the opportunity because they were oversubscribed do we want to liquidate our position at that point and then you could distribute, as Lee's saying, you could distribute um, back to investors and back to new lab investors because our carry would come back in. Um, with that specific opportunity, the investors in that SPV didn't want to get off the train. <laughs> they wanted to keep going on the ride because they felt the valuation level, although a strong return on investment, still had more growth to come. And so that's all often a decision we have to grapple with. But what it did give to us was exposure to exactly Lee's question, which is that's where liquidity will become an option, is that we can liquidate our SPVs when oversubscribed rounds occur. We don't have to wait, in theory, for an IPO or an acquisition of the entity. And then you can distribute back, essentially, dividends back to our top co-investors and also get the return on investment back to the SPV holders, which is, is a, will be a great outcome. Well, love what you said. Uh, we do have another question. This one from Jerry Chu. It says, what technologies or innovations do you see in the field that excite you the most recently? That's a great one. Um, we did a bunch of pilots here in New York on bi-directional charges and ended up finding Fermata Energy um, was the most viable solution from a bi-directional charging perspective. And so these are electric vehicle charges that can not only charge the vehicle, take power from Con Edison and put it on the vehicle, but they can also take power off of the vehicle and put it back on the grid. So they could actually generate income from the utility company by selling the power on the vehicle at, at certain times. It's essentially, you know this world better than I do, it's essentially arbitraging the cost per kilowatt of electricity, which but, is you're tracking- start. Sean, forgive me. I just wanted, for the audience's benefit, the way power is generated, the, as a utility, you turn on your cheapest power generator first, and then you work your way up to the most expensive later, depending on where demand is. So if you're trying to arbitrage electricity rates, there are certain times a day when demand is at its highest levels and you can sell electricity back to the utility at those premium prices. There's other times when demand is lower and you can bench basically pull power off the grid. And in this case, recharge your car with cheap energy and sell it back at expensive rates. So please keep going, but I just want to make sure people understood that. No, you nailed it. And so that example is my car is sitting out there right now on a Fermata charging system. And while I sit here from 8 a.m. till 6.37, my car is making decisions on selling the power on the battery if the pr price per kilowatt just seems like a good deal to get. And, and then it can charge back the car up later in the day, four o'clock, five o'clock, when the cost per kilowatt declines. And so it's a mini little arbitrage, which you know our Chevy Bolts we have here are $260 monthly lease payments. And they're averaging north of $500 in profit off of each vehicle through the bi-directional system. So epiphany number one, learning about Fermata and piloting it was, you actually have a way to lower the cost of, of vehicle ownership in the EV space if you have these bi-directional systems. Now, the concerns you could raise are battery wear and tear. If you're charging a lot, that's gonna erode the battery that you need to think about. Also, when you get wider market adoption, this obviously more people arbitraging makes it harder to do it, obviously. But this, the second test we did was where the epiphanies really came about the potential of a solution like this, which is you can't store 
energy in New York City buildings, as an example, because of the lithium ion batteries are a flammable and a safety risk, health and safety risk. But what we did was we took three or four electric vehicles, put them on a bi-directional charging system with Fermata. And if the power goes out to your building, you can run whatever systems you can off of whatever level of energy you have on the vehicles. So you could shut down the power to New Lab and run the emergency systems, the, the security systems through the cars in the parking lot. You essentially have a decentralized power grid, which is as big as the amount of cars you have and could be stored in any New York building that can park vehicles, as an example. So the two kind of outcomes of the pilots, well, one is the car can actually generate income while it's sitting in a parking lot, which is pretty interesting. And the second was, and the more vehicles you have, if you have a fleet of a thousand Verizon delivery vans and service vans, all on a bi-directional system, you have a thousand vehicle batteries that are all your additional power grid and source of power for the business overall. Um, really interesting. Uh, Verizon, as a result of the pilot, ended up investing 35 million in their, in their first fundraising round at Fermata based on the insights from, from those tests we just mentioned. Well, listen, Sean, again, it's been an absolute pleasure to hear all the exciting developments that you're pursuing at New Lab. I really feel fortunate that you were able to share some of those experiences with our audience and our LP base today. So, again, I want to really thank you for your precious time. Um, I did want to end on time. We're technically at 201, so I'm a minute over, so don't shoot me. But, Sean, thank you so much. For everything and look forward to talking to you soon. Good to see you, Mark. Thanks again for your time and thanks to everyone on the audience. I'll speak to you soon. All right. Bye, everybody. We'll talk soon.